It's not fair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa rakat. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shurooriya nfusina wa masayyati a'malina man yahdihi illa fala mudillalah wa man yudlil falan tajida lahu waliya murshida wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah al-ahadu al-qahhar wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. Indeed, all praise and thanks belongs to Allah تبارك وتعالى alone. We seek His help, His assistance, and guidance in all things. He whom Allah تبارك وتعالى guides, there is none that can misguide him. And he whom Allah تبارك وتعالى leads astray, there is none that can guide him, except through the will and permission of Allah تبارك وتعالى alone. And I bear witness and testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And that Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib al Hashmi al Qurashi was the final messenger and prophet sent to all of mankind. O you who believe, fear Allah, fear Allah as He deserves to be feared, and do not die except in a state of Islam. Do not die except that you are Muslims. Rabbi shrahli sadri, wa yassirli amri, wa ahlul uqta min lisani yafqahu qawli. Alhamdulillah, this is lesson 30 in our reading of. Riyadh al-Salihin and lesson 6 in the chapter of patience. Now today's lesson is the response of Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu at the greatest calamity to befall this ummah. So I want you to think about what the position is. It is the death of the best of creation. Right. I want you to all think about what we're going to talk about. At the point of just before the death of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the response to the death of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest calamity to befall this ummah. There's no bigger problem that has ever happened. No bigger musibah that has ever descended than the death of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was rahmatun lil'alameen, a mercy to all of mankind. So how did his daughter respond to the death of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And we take lessons from it. And the point that we focus on as well especially is the point of sabr, patience that a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had at the point of his death. At the point of his death. An Anas radiallahu anhu qal, Lama thaqula Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ja'ala yatagashahu al-karb. فقالت فاطمة رضي الله عنها وكرب أبتا فقال ليس على أبيك كرب بعد اليوم فلما مات قالت يا أبتاه أجاب ربا دعاه يا أبتاه جنة الفردوس مأواه يا أبتاه إلى جبريل ننعاه فلما دفن قالت فاطمة رضي الله عنها أطابت أنفسكم أن تحثوا على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم التراب رواه البخاري أطابت أنفسكم أن تحثوا على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم التراب رواه البخاري On the authority of Anas رضي الله عنه who stated when the state of the messenger صلوات الله وسلامه عليه became extremely dire his illness would cause him to become unconscious. Fatima radiallahu anha said, Oh, the pain and distress, my beloved father. Oh, the pain and distress, my beloved father. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi he replied, There will not be upon your father any pain or distress after today. 
there will not be any pain or distress upon your father after today. Once the Prophet Sallallahu had passed away, Fatima radiallahu anha, she said, O oh my father, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has responded to your call. O oh my father, Jannat al-Firdaus, the highest level of Jannah is for you. O oh my father, unto Jibreel we announce your passing. When the burial of the Prophet Sallallahu was complete, Fatima radiallahu anha, she said, are you satisfied now that you put earth over the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam collected by Al-Bukhari? In this hadith, we see the response of Fatima Radiallahu Anha, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of his death. And in this hadith, we see that the final sickness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his condition became extremely difficult. The situation that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in was extremely painful. And the sickness that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go through, generally speaking, was very, very hard. Aisha Radiallahu Anha would say, and this is found in Al-Bukhari, that I never saw anyone suffer in so much pain more than a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from sickness. That when he would become sick, no one would feel pain like he felt pain. He was in extreme agony, extreme pain from the severity of the sickness that would befall him. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would feel such intense pain that Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu an said that while the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was suffering from an intense fever one time, I visited him and I said, O messenger of Allah, you have an intensely high fever. Your fever is intensely high. It's very, very high. You're very, you, fever is no joke. And then he said, yes, I have as much fever as two men among you. That when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would become sick, it was equivalent to the sickness of two people. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not chilling just because he was a prophet. He wasn't just hanging out. He wasn't ex يعني, enjoying the pleasures of this life and no difficulties had come upon him. He was also in positions of pain and agony. And why this was the case? Because he would have double the reward as found in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why he would go through this pain of, for instance, double the sickness was double the reward. And he understood the essence of sabr, of patience, that even if it's as minute as the prick of a thorn, as we took last week, your sins are wiped away. And the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, they're wiped away like a tree sheds leaves. That's how much sickness or any form of distress wipes away your sins. And subhanAllah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was promised Jannah. He was promised paradise. He was the last prophet. He was promised the paradise. And not just any paradise, he was promised the highest point of paradise. And even that, his concern was where? That he was going to get double the reward because of his sickness. That's where he was, his thought was, that was his mindset. This is a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is wiping away sin. Yani, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not sitting there and complaining. He wasn't yani, writing a Facebook rant or yani, doing a rant and a video on TikTok or anything like that. He was patient, suffering patiently, hoping the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what a believer is supposed to do. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends him anything in his direction, any form of distress, any form of harm, he is hoping for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, he was showing us the peak of patience and that you cannot expect to show patience except if trials and calamities and sickness and pain comes your way. If sickness comes your way, then you can be patient. You can show your patience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If calamity is sent to you, then you can show that patience. But if nothing is sent your way and everything is blissful and your life is Jannah, then what are you going to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're patient? How? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was no regular human being. Right? He was the final prophet. And we know that the ones who are tested the most are who? The prophets. The prophets are the most tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the righteous and those who are like them. So 
if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you, this is not necessary, يعني, it doesn't necessitate that you are an evil person or that Allah hates you or that Allah wants to see you suffer or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enjoying this. لا حول لا قوة إلا بالله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests those he loves. And that could be a form of showing you your position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the ones who are punished most, the ones who are tested most, عفوا, not punished, the ones who are tested most are the prophets and then the righteous and those who are like them. They are the ones who are going to be tested the most. Now, subhanallah, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in extreme pain during his final sickness, in his final stages. And subhanallah, if we look at the narrations closely, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was complaining to Aisha radiallahu anha, telling her that I feel the poison that was given to me by the Jewish lady. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was served food that was poisoned. Right? One of the companions ate it, he just took a bite and dropped dead immediately. Immediately. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already taken a bite. So that person just dropped dead from how much poison was laced in the food. And then the food told the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not eat me for I am poisoned. But he had already taken a bite. And so he was complaining at the point of his death that I still feel the poison in my, in my body. I still feel it. Subhanallah, he would go in and out of consciousness. He would go in and out of consciousness. And when he would come back into consciousness, he would be in an extreme sense of fever. And one of the narrations, subhanallah, it says that he ordered that water be brought from seven different places in Medina, in seven different vessels. And he ordered that, they, that, that seven vessels be poured over him to fight the fever, to find comfort. He was in extreme pain to pour water over you seven times to fight this pain that he was going through, subhanAllah. And he was Khalil al-Rahman. He was the most beloved on earth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put these trials in his life. He made him face this distress and this pain, and this agony. And this was to teach us all that the path of sabr is not easy, but it's the path of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, you will be tested in this world, and if you are lucky, if you have a good place with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then you'll be trialed in this world much, and your hereafter will be easy. Because why? Your sins are forgiven when you are trialed in this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes away your sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you rewards for your patience. So the ones who are trialed much in this dunya, they will have less to answer for. They will have more forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their akhirah will be easier. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our akhirah easy. Ya Rab. Also, something that is important, and we have to make note of this, is that if someone has a death and it's not easy, if someone has a painful death, right, he goes through a lot of struggling before his death, then this is not always a bad sign. This is not always a bad sign. Yani the death of the Prophet ﷺ wasn't easy. So are we going to say, oh, Allah punished him before he died? La hawla la quwwata illa billah. Na'udhu billah. Right? This is something that is blasphemous. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went through the sakarat. He went through the pangs and pains of death. And this is something that for a believer is going to be an expiation for his sins. Wiping away his sins and an elevation of his ranks. And he is closer to the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanallah, he, extreme, he experienced this extreme pain. So do not assume 
that just because someone feels pain and goes through a long form of pain before his death, that this is a punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not the judge on this dunya. You are not the judge of this, in this dunya to say, this person, his death is a punishment. How do you know? How do you know? Unless he's a clear enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's put that on the side. I'm saying a believer, a person who is a Muslim, and the brother goes through, مثلاً, يعني, some of the chemos that are out there, they're extremely painful يعني, uh, treatments. Extremely painful treatments. So are we going to say that Allah is punishing this person? That's, a, that's what the family needs to hear now? That's what the people around يعني, the family need to hear, that Allah punished this person? Where's your rahma? Where's your mercy? Continuing the hadith. No more tangents. Continuing the hadith, Fatima radiallahu anha, she says, Oh my dear father, the pain and distress. And she is feeling sad, right? This is يعني, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there will not be upon your father after today any form of distress nor harm. Now, she did not scream this out. This is not an niyaha which is manhiyun an. This is not something that is forbidden. That, يعني, what is forbidden is that when someone dies, you go out on the streets and you start screaming, wailing out loud, out loud right? Shouting in pain. She didn't do this. She was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and expressing her distress to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not to the general public. So it was something that was done privately, witnessing the death of her father. And in this we see that if someone expresses grief in this stage in a way that is not forbidden, which is that they cry, cry loudly for everyone to hear, and they scream and shout, or they slap their faces, and they rip their clothes, and they wail loudly. If they do not do this, then they say words of grief, and they're not cursing the sickness. That is something that is important. This is also the, that which is forbidden, that you are not allowed to curse sickness itself. Right? You can't, you know, there are some people who write statuses up cursing, cancer, or cursing. It's not something that you do. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the one who sent it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're not supposed to curse the actual disease itself. Now, just saying, for instance, O oh Father, you're going through extreme, extreme pain and you're feeling the pain of the one who is going through it. There is no harm in this and this is okay. Okay, this is okay. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam importantly did not rebuke her. Right, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not rebuke her. If she did something wrong, the Prophet ﷺ would be the first person to correct. And we have يعني, famous ahadith of this when Nabi ﷺ made example of his family members and said, if my family were to do a sin, then I would be the first to hold them in يعني, judgment. I would hold them to account. Even if my family sinned, they're not above the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? There's none of that in Islam. Now, after that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't rebuke her, he tried to console her. And then he said that after today, I'm not going to go through any pain. That after today, I'm going to be with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, I'm going to be in the paradise, and this pain that I'm going through is going to cease, it's going to finish. And then all of the fitna of this dunya ceases, and then it's the akhirah, it's the hereafter. Now, once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had passed away, Fatima radiallahu anha then said, O oh my father, Allah, has responded to your call. O oh my father, Jannat al firdaus the highest level of Jannah, is for you. O oh my father, unto Jibreel we announce your passing. Now this is beautiful, subhanAllah. We know in the famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said before his death that a servant was given a choice. This is the Prophet saying before he died. A servant. He describes himself as a servant. He doesn't say the best among you the, the, the most beloved to Allah. No, no, no. He just says, a servant, a servant was given a choice by Allah. A servant was given a choice by Allah to be given the bounties of this earth and whatever he wished for. This is one side. Or that which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reward. 
This was what an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was presented with. You either stay in the dunya and you get whatever you want in the dunya. The dunya is yours. Or that which Allah has from His favor. That which Allah has in His reward. And He says, and the servant chose that which is with Allah. Because he didn't want anything from the dunya. The hum of a believer is the akhirah, is the hereafter. He doesn't want anything from this worldly life. He could have had it. This is Allah giving him the choice. And to Allah belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. If he wants to bestow something upon someone, is there anyone who is going to say no? Is there anything that could be withheld? If Allah gives the entire earth, the entire bounty upon a person, that person is done. Like he's mashaAllah, he's made it, right? There's no one that's gonna say that something is wrong going on here. No, he's gonna have everything if Allah gives him everything, yes? And so that was on one scale. And he's feeling all this pain, all this distress. It's an easy way out. It's an easy way out. Oh, خلاص, you can get whatever you want. Good health, wealth, all the... يعني, خلاص, no more examples. <laughs> Everything that is good in this dunya. Or that which Allah has from his reward. And the servant, يعني, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, chose that which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was constantly repeating... Rafiq al-A'la, Allahumma Rafiq al-A'la, right? Oh Allah, the highest companionship, the highest companionship, right? I want to be close to Allah. I choose to be with Allah. I don't want to be here. I choose to be with Allah. I want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to be here anymore. And this was the choice that was given to a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can stay or you can go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, the highest companionship, the highest companionship, I want to be with Allah. Now, subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would constantly tell his sahaba that if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then ask for al-firdaus. Ask, when you ask Allah for anything, ask for the best. Ask for the highest point of Jannah. Don't say, Ya Allah, just get me in. Right? Don't just skim through Jannah. Right, just I just want the lowest reward of Jannah. Right, just if I'm in, I'm sorted. Right, it's paradise. How bad could it be? Right, like uh, uh, it's okay. No, but he's Nabi Sallallahu can constantly ask, told the companions, ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for the highest point in Jannah, and the highest point of Jannah isn't for anyone other than the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not for anyone other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, but he is saying to every everyone in this Ummah, ask Allah for the best. And so he used to ask Allah for the best. And Fatima radiallahu anha says that you, O Messenger of Allah, are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where? In Jannat al-Firdaus. That's your abode. That's your position. That's where you're going to go now. That you are going to be in Jannat al-Firdaus. And Jannat al-Firdaus, my brothers and sisters, is the highest point of Jannah. There is nothing above that point in Jannah from the paradise. Above Jannat al-Firdaus is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's literally the highest point that someone can go. And that is specific, this position, this level, the highest point of this level is given to a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is his favor. Now, she says, we inform Jibreel, the Archangel Gabriel, right? We inform Jibreel of his passing. SubhanAllah, what's beautiful about this? Throughout the life of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a prophet, Jibreel would come with revelation from Allah, from the sky, right? From Allah, from above, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from that which is the orders and the commands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But something that happens now on earth, with the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she says, we inform Jibreel now of the death of an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because it was before Jibreel would come, Allah has said this, this is the revelation, right? But when the death, now Jibreel Rasul Sallam is going up. So it's like we, يعني, this is from sadness. This is all from a point of sadness, right? So remember, the death of her father, not just a Nabi, not just the Prophet, no, no, it's her father. So she says that يعني, we now inform Jibreel of his passing. Then, subhanAllah, if we look closely, this is all before the point of death. 
This is all afwan, before the point of burial. Before the point of burial. And they are talking to the Prophet wasallam in first person. So some people have taken this as an example to say that you are allowed to ask the Prophet wasallam for things in your supplications. And we know that this is an incorrect position and this is not permissible in Islam. Now if we look very closely at what she said, what did she say? That Allah has responded to your call. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you Al-Firdaus, the highest point in Jannah. And unto Jibreel we inform your passing. Yes? Did she say, disaster has struck us, help us. Give us risk, give us provision, give us a messenger of Allah in your death after now he has passed away. Give us things from the ghayb, give us things from the unseen. No. So the scholars make a very, very finite point here, very important point over here. That at the point of death, before the burial, if someone was to speak to the dead, to the body, from the family, right? And not ask anything from the person. Just say that, inshallah, Jannah is for you. You used to be close to your family. Just the words of yani, sadness coming from a person who needs consolation. Right? He needs to be consoled. So he says these from, words from a point of sadness and not asking anything from the person who has passed away. Then this is allowed. This is permissible. And another point of evidence for this is that Abu Bakr radiallahu an, when Umar radiallahu an was outside and he was very emotional at the point of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr radiallahu an came into the room where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's body was and he lifted the shroud off the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he looked at the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, you were beautiful in life and you were beautiful in death and he kissed the forehead of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he's talking to what? An inanimate body. A body that has no life in it now. So over here, this is another example of that if a person was going to do this before the point of burial, then this is permissible, but not to ask anything then other than Allah. Your link is with Allah. And this was the body of the Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him. Right? If there was anyone you ask, it'd be this, this time, now. But none of them did it. No, none of the companions did this. None of the companions asked from the body of the Prophet wasallam for anything that a Nabi wasallam could not give. So then the narration continues. SubhanAllah. And she says, is your heart now filled with ease? Right? Is your heart... Yeah, and she says this from a point of sadness, right? Are you satisfied now that you have poured dirt over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Messenger? Have you become satisfied? And when we look at this narration, there are other narrations that help us understand this narration. In another narration, she says to Anas, who is the narrator of this hadith, she says, Oh Anas, how did your hearts find ease that you poured dirt over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you claimed to love him, you had this love for him. How did your hearts find ease? Think of this as a daughter saying to those who buried her father, how could you do it? From a point of sadness, not of a point of it's not religiously possible or that this is going against the law of Allah. She's saying this from a point of sadness. How did you find the strength? Are you, how could you find it in your heart to pour dirt over the messenger of Allah who you loved so much? You loved him so much. How did your heart find it possible to pour dirt over the messenger of Allah? And the narration says that Anas radiallahu an did not reply to her. He couldn't. He couldn't reply to her. What do you say to a grieving daughter? Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he mentions that he did not reply. But what his state replied, right? Lisanul hal. What his actions replied was that we were forced to do this. We were compelled to do this because of we, us following the commands 
of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, following the example that he set for us, following the teachings that he set for us, we didn't want to do it, we had to do it. But he didn't say anything. In another narration, which is found in uh, Musnad Bazzar, Ibn Hajar Rahimahullah, says that it's Jayyid, which means, implies that there's some sort of weakness in it. But it states, this not other narration, it says that we poured dirt over the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until our hearts could not withstand it. Until our hearts said, no, we can't do it anymore. Think about it. These were the, the most beloved to a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They loved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than anyone else. I don't think in a hadith, in Sahih al-Bukhari or in the narrations that you will find a companion, generally speaking, going to a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except addressing him in a specific way. Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. This is how they would address the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May my parents be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. May harm come on me before it comes on you. And then they'd say, that, yani, any questions they had, or anything they need to ask, or anything they need to inform him, then they'd continue. But this was the introduction. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you. The companions radiallahu anhum, they had so much love for Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that some of the companions who lived years, 20, 30 years with Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were asked yani, later on, how did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam look like? What did he look like? And they said, we cannot reply to you, we cannot respond to you because we couldn't look him in the face. We revered him so much that we would look down when he was in front of us. Even the disbelievers at the time, they would say that when the companions were around the Prophet wasallam, their heads were bowed as if birds were on their heads. That's how still they were around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Grown men who would fight over what? When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make wudu, they would try to get the water from a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wudu. Grown men. And if a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be upset with them, it was as if all, everything had gone away and only just pain and suffering was in their lives. Grown men who would cry in front of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when this happened, the greatest calamity, their lives changed. Bilal radiallahu an was unable to do the adhan completely after that. Bilal the mu'adhin, the one who would call to prayer in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so many times in the hadiths we see a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Arihna ya Bilal, give us comfort, O Bilal, call the adhan. Call the call to prayer. Right? So, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his go-to was Bilal radiallahu an to call the prayer. An African slave who was freed by Abu Bakr to show the rest of the companions that there's no racism in Islam. This is my person. They said that his Arabic was broken at times. That it would be very obvious to know that he wasn't from an Arab family. His Arabic was there in a way where it was obvious that he was an immigrant. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose him to be the mu'adhin, to call to prayer, even on the day of Al-Fatih, the conquest of Mecca. But the story that I'm trying to get to is that at the time of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first prayer then came. Bilal tries to do the adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. What's the next verse? Huh? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Right? I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. What's the next verse? Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And he couldn't do it. I testify that the messenger, what? Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But at this point, he could not go any further. And he would break down in tears, and the narrations say that all of Medina would be in tears. To the point where he came to Abu Bakr Bilal, and he came to be, came, Bilal came to Abu Bakr and said, 
I can't stay in Medina anymore. I can't do it. Everywhere I look, I see the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu is no longer here. Send me away. Abu Bakr tried to say no. He tried to say, I want you next to me. I want you close to me. And he said, if you freed me to be your slave, then let me be with you. But if you freed me for the sake of Allah, then let me go. So he let him go. And then another time, subhanAllah, it has been narrated that another time came where Jerusalem was opened. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open it once again. Umar radiallahu an, he goes out to take the keys of Jerusalem by himself, riding a donkey. <laughs> right? It's literally Umar, the way that Umar was. He gets there, takes the key, everything happens. They take conquest of Jerusalem. He says, Bilal, Adhan, please. Please. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have wanted this. He tries to make Adhan. He couldn't get, this is years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu Years after. Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah could not do it. He couldn't make the rest of the Adhan or the, the companions are in tears. Grown men. This is the love of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine trying to bury a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Fatima radiallahu anha, she's saying these words of, how could you do it? You loved him, how could you do it? And they're saying that, we didn't, we didn't respond to it, but we were forced to do it. Because it was the right of the dead body. You have to bury the dead. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect and preserve us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from that which we listen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this an evidence for us and not against us. Inshallah next week we continue, which will be the last lesson uh, until after Ramadan. And next week inshallah uh, is a good one. Uh, so inshallah we get to see you next week and then after that we continue after Ramadan barakallahu feekum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh make it small 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 make it small